This podcast is brought to you by People's Light, a cultural and civic center with theater at its core, celebrating its 49th season. For more information, visit peopleslight.org. Welcome to Cratchit's Table, a Christmas Carol podcast. This is a limited series roundtable discussion with the cast and creative team of Christmas Carol, running at People's Light from November 15th to December 31st. You can get your tickets on the People's Light website. Infused with original music and traditional English carols, and performed by a stellar ensemble, this jubilant retelling of the beloved Yuletide ghost story is the perfect way to celebrate the holidays. Bring your loved ones aged 6 to 106. On this podcast, we're going to dig into everything that is Christmas Carol, from why we tell this story over and over to its potential to be quite problematic. We'll be joined by a variety of guests and perspectives. I'm your host, Andrew Watring, People's Light's Community Programs Creative Director and the Associate Director of Christmas Carol. Throughout the episodes, I'll always be joined by People's Light's producing artistic director and the adapter and composer of Christmas Carol, Zach Berkman. How you doing, Zach? Aua, Andrew. Great sitting across from the table with you. This series will be four episodes long, past, present, future, and forever. We'll ask two questions of each guest, one reoccurring question that I will ask Zach today and one specific to the episode. That being said, Zach, what is your relationship with Christmas Carol? Well, I go way back with Charles Dickens, or Chuck, as some of us have called him. In fifth grade, I read everything I could, David Copperfield, Oliver Twist, a lot of his short stories, including Cricket on the Hearth, another holiday story, which was actually my favorite, and then read Christmas Carol, but it didn't quite register on me in the way that I think it does for some when they're younger. For me, it wasn't really until I saw The Muppets Christmas Carol that I really fell in love with the story, and partly just because my kids loved it and my son would go around the house stomping with an umbrella and pretending it was his cane and all those kind of things. And suddenly I, I developed an affection for Christmas Carol in a whole new way. And then it was around 2018 that the former executive artistic director here at People's Light, Abby Adams, handed me this beautiful annotated copy of the novel and said, uh, I'd like you to consider adapting this for us. And for some reason, that request led me to dive into the material in a very different way. First, I realized I had a lot of resistance to it because over time I had learned a bit about Dickens' anti-Semitism and the way in which Scrooge could be portrayed as the classic moneylender with the large nose and all the Jewish stereotypes that go along with that. And that made me nervous. Uh, And I started thinking about lots of different ways to really subvert the story and kind of deconstruct it. But then as I read the novel more closely that time that Abby gave it to me, I I realized that the whole first part of it is about a man experiencing an intense amount of grief, that he had lost a dear friend, Marley, uh, many years earlier, and he had yet to take his name off of his desk or even change anything from his desk, take his name off the store name. And they lived together and he left all of his rooms untouched uh, aside from changing the clocks here and there. And I realized, oh, this is a really profound tale about the trauma of losing someone, the developing of a cold heart in the process, and then how that thaw can occur. And that that's the miracle is the sort of the ability to love again. So I really delved deeper into that. That was my real opening into the story. And I came back and said, well, if I can tell it this way, if I can really sort of explore the psychology of Scrooge and what his childhood was like and the traumas he experienced and why Marley was so important to him, then I would have a way in. So that was happening on one level. On the other level was I knew I wanted to make it a play with music not a musical. We can get into the controversy of what qualifies (laughs) as a musical and what isn't a musical. But I knew I wanted to use a lot of music within the show, especially music from the same era that that Dickens was writing in originally. So these are 19th century carols, British carols. And I happened to grow up as a huge fan of British folk music. And uh, in fact, my brother and I used to go into our attic and play around with British folk songs and and including Christmas carols and figure out how to rockify them in some way. We were big fans 
of a band called Steel Ice Fan that used to do this in Fairport Convention. I'm just going to toss those out. And then we were also huge fans of Joan Baez's Noel album, which we listened to every Christmas. And so some of the songs that I ended up adapting were ones that she also had in that anthology. So I knew on one hand I wanted to play around with the music of the era and do some interesting things about that, adapting that music and adapting the story in a way that I thought could really help us because here we are in a moment now it's after covid i was writing it in the leading into covid and feeling like a lot of people were experiencing grief and looking for new ways to heal themselves communally individually and that was a lot of the impulse into this adaptation well speak a little bit more about those impulses when this is people's light's second time doing christmas carol so what were those initial impulses about how to tackle this story how to put people's lights and your spin on it and then what did that evolution look like to coming to this new adaptation so ultimately we reopened the theater with christmas carol that was not the original plan the original plan was to produce it i think in the fall of 2020 as an effort because we've been producing pantos for years and we knew we needed a little extra time to develop our next original panto and the thought was that we would slot in christmas carol here and then we'll see later on as a as a, as a sort of placeholder for the holiday show Then we shut down, and what we did instead that holiday was to produce something called Christmas Carol in Concert, which was we turned one of our stages into basically a television studio, and we very carefully brought people into the space one by one, and they read sections of the novel and performed some of the music that I had composed for the adaptation. And that was really informative, and we learned actually quite a lot. I learned quite a lot about how I wanted to adapt the play even further through that process. And then we re-reopened with the full production of it. But even in that circumstance, you were talking about socially distanced houses, everyone wearing masks. We couldn't have any young people in the audience until near the end because everyone needed to be vaccinated, and they weren't yet vaccinating kids. Uh, We had very few kids in the show itself. So it felt like we were sort of stripped down in terms of some of what we could do in terms of interacting with the audience, in terms of just the way the storytelling worked. Then we ultimately learned a lot about how to do that show, but we framed it within a COVID context. The whole opening and the whole ending was acknowledging how difficult it's been and how much it's, it felt still even a little scary to all be coming together in a theater space. So that's a little different now. Now we are able to really sort of conceive of this production really as something that might have a chance of not only being produced this year, but might have multiple years where it might come back at different times. We are not done producing Pantos, but we can definitely imagine the desire to produce Christmas Carol here and there as that goes. Well, yeah. So moving from your role as an adapter and a composer more to your role as producing artistic director, I've spoken to a lot of people in theater who, when they hear that a theater's doing Christmas Carol, they roll their eyes and they say, enough is enough. The time of Christmas Carol needs to go over. It needs to be over. And I happen to be, I love Christmas Carol, and so I'm not in that camp, but I'm interested for you, why Christmas Carol? There seem to be a lot of other holiday texts. There seem to be a lot of other opportunities. The panto, why Christmas Carol? Yeah, it's a great question because, look, I mean, definitely... Christmas Carol has been the gateway drug for the American theater in many facets and has been something that a lot of theaters say they need to have to raise the money and make the money to be able to do more experimental work and things like that. I think we've also seen that there are other kinds of holiday productions that do that as well. In our case, the Panto was that too. I am one that sort of lives on the continuum of Why Christmas Carol because I think that there is an argument to be made that it perpetuates certain bad thoughts about how change occurs in the world. And at the same time, I think it celebrates the possibility of redemption and forgiveness in a really accessible, powerful way that people of all generations can respond to and relate to. So for me, it's not just Christmas Carol as a thing into itself, like should we be doing Christmas Carol, but it's how are we doing Christmas Carol? Who are we including in that story? What kind of thoughts and ideas are we hoping to generate in the telling of it? And how do we make a communal experience that people feel like is truly healing and celebratory and wonderful in the year? But yeah, I'm not sure there's a great argument for why it has to be Christmas Carol. That may be a question to also ask audiences and why they will only come to Christmas Carol and not something else. 
Well, this is definitely going to be a very interesting conversation, and we hope that you continue the conversation in the comments. Be on the lookout on People's Light social media for future episodes. If you're feeling generous, please donate to People's Light on our website at peopleslight.org support. We hope to see you come out to Christmas Carol running at People's Light from November 15th to December 31st. You can get your tickets on the People's Light website at peopleslight.org. Aua! Aua! Thank you.